My guest today is Deidre McCloskey, a professor emerita of economics, history, English, and of communication at the University of Illinois at Chicago. She has written 24 books and hundreds of academic and popular articles on statistical and economic theory, economic history, philosophy, liberalism, feminism, and queer studies. Deidre has a PhD in economics from Harvard and taught for many years at the University of Chicago. Deidre McCloskey is really, really a huge pleasure to, to have you here. I've been a big fan of your work since in graduate school in Chicago in the early 90s. I read your work on the rhetoric of economics and how there is a difference between what economists say we do and what we actually do. So I've been, I've been very, very much following your career. Um, and, um, and I wanted to, to talk about something that is very related, touches very much on what you did on, uh, on your last books, uh, which has to do with, with, with coercion and with growth. Um, we are facing a gigantic uh, economic shock and a health shock in this pandemic. And the question that everybody is wondering about is how it changes our future, how it changes capitalism, and in particular, whether the coercion and increasing the role of the state and the coercion of the state that we are experiencing these this, uh, months, these weeks, these long weeks, um, is here to stay? Will it, we will withdraw? Is it justified? What's your view? Well, I think that it, that in a plague, coercion by the authorities, who really are, is necessary. Uh, in, in Venice, in the Middle Ages, they knew how to close the economy, or at least close entry to the economy. In 1918, American Samoa was free entirely of the so-called Spanish flu. As you know, it wasn't Spanish. It always well, started in Kansas. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. We got the bad rap there. But the, the, the American Samoa was completely clear because the general in charge, the American general in charge, closed down entry to Samoa. For, for the duration, and it worked, and they, they didn't have any fatalities at all. And, but of course, the only countries that did that, the only places that did that were South Korea, which jumped on it right away, and uh, Hong Kong, quite surprisingly, there it is, right next door to mainland China, and, um, and, uh, um, and a few other places. Iceland, I think, did, did a good job. So early on, coercion is necessary. Once you don't do that early coercion, which you know is such a clear externality, we all know, with it, there's no great externality with the seasonal flu, because it's R not the the number of people infected re, infected by one person is rather small for ordinary influenza. It's somewhat higher, about you know, it's about it's between two and three for this new virus, and that's the problem. But so there's an externality, and we as economists understand that perfectly well. Um, but with the small R not um, private incentives for old people like me to get their shots, and you have the shot, suffices. Not for this, probably. Okay, having not done it right, and some of them did it spectacularly wrong, like my own country. I won't comment on Spain, I'm not sure about it, but I, they didn't do it too well, or they would be in much better shape. They'd be in the shape that Germany's in. Um, Germany did it better, not perfectly, but better. Uh, then you're in, as we economists call it, a second best. Or in this case, something like a fifth or sixth best. So to flatten the curve, they say, et cetera, et cetera, a certain amount of state coercion is necessary. And people are always saying it's like a war. Well, okay, it's like a war. But wars shouldn't be an occasion for introducing fascism, <laughs> which you know, in Hungary, for example, Urban is using it as an excuse to tighten his grip. But 
you have argued absolutely, absolutely right. You have argued that every time there is a war, there is an increase in the size of the state, etc. And it's basically more or less a permanent increase. It's really hard to reverse. That's right. How do we ensure that this is not the case now? Well, we, we, we can't, but observe that earlier wars didn't have this ability. The, in the Napoleonic, the French wars of the late 18th, early 19th century, Britain spent quite large shares of national income, sort of modern shares of national income, uh, uh, fighting the French, finally defeated them in 1815, and then stopped. They, they disbanded the armies and navies and blah, blah, blah. And within actually about 30 years, they had repaid the, they had, they had paid off the national debt. Like the United States after the Second World War, the, the debt to income ratio was about two, right? They, they said, okay, the war is over. So there's something else going on. My, my friend Bob Higgs is the great student of this and Bob, points out that indeed, as you said, wars in the 20th century tended to result in continuously rising shares of national income spent and regulated by the government. But come on, earlier wars didn't, as I just told you. So there's something else going on. And I think what it is, 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 the, uh, is the ideology of, of socialism. It's ideas that, that, that matter to this kind of political decision. If we were all devoted liberals, as in, especially in the mid 19th century, a lot of intellectuals were, you know, are uh, Henry David Thoreau and John Stuart Mill and Bastiat in France, et cetera, et cetera. Then we would all say, oh no, we, we, we must not use this as an excuse. So I, I, I think, this is our job, as at least I view myself as a liberal in the Spanish sense, not in the American sense, which is very strange. In North and South America, the word liberal has been completely corrupted. In, that, in the United States, it means social democrat. In Latin America, it means largely authoritarian centralizer. Nothing to do. Whereas in Spain and, and in France and so on, and, and, you know, Ma, Ma, uh, Macron is, is calls himself a liberal. Absolutely, and, and that's the that's the group in the European Parliament where we are in this indeed. Um, right. So there is there is an expansion from political coercion to economic coercion. Yeah, there, um, there are particularly, I mean, probably the issue where that's going to be more not noticeable is in the area of of. Uh, interventions in supply chains, in global uh, trade, and the idea that you, can, you need to have security of supply. Those are, I mean, very big threats ideologically as ideas, as you're saying, to the whole construct of, of, of liberal democracy and a free uh, rules-based trading order. Um, but in some sense, without the policeman, without the U.S. willing to take the police role, then every, every man for, for himself and every woman for herself. Yeah, yeah this new world. Um, how, how, is, how should we think of economic coercion in a different way or is it, is it the same thing? Well, during the coronavirus, it's something we, we need to access. How are we going to avoid uh, this, this deglobalization that to many appears, uh, appears uh, preordained almost? Well, step one, defeat Donald Trump in November. <laughs> because I think if he's defeated, and I think he will be, because true to form, he's, he's completely failed in his management of this problem. Um, if, if he loses, it will uh, diminish the prestige and the morale of, of, uh, of, uh, of at least right-wing populists worldwide. Bolsonaro in Brazil is kind of a junior and slightly even crazier version. No, maybe not. They're both pretty crazy version of uh, of Trump. They're both bad. And that's right. And and so I, I think that's step one because we might be able to reestablish those international institutions, or not reestablish exactly, but 
bolster them, get them supported. Um, you know, this crazy way he's gone after the uh, World Health Organization, which is not blameless in this and is not, but you know, it's a United Nations agency. So of course it's corrupt and slightly stupid, but it's essential. And he's, he's, he, he goes after all these international organizations and maybe we can recompose the, um, the spirit of, uh, of, well, you know, it's, it's a kind of a paradox in my mind because the person behind a lot of these institutions was the hero of my youth, John Maynard Keynes. And Keynes is the great, um, uh, speaking of ideas, is the great uh, saint of statism, right? He's the, or he's the Saint Paul <laughs> of, 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 of statism. And um, so, you know, the World Bank and the IMF and World Trade Organization and blah, 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 they're all kind of children of John Maynard Keynes. And that's not, that's not all goodness. Uh, that's not liberalism, but on the other hand, it's a kind of a, um, it's, it's, it's a kind of a, look, some sort of worldy government, not world government, but worldy, worldish government can protect, can, can get people to cooperate instead of, as you said, every woman for herself. Which I'm afraid is what Donald Trump and others have been. Yeah, actually, yeah, that's what Putin would like. So, so I take your view uh, broadly to be that that okay, there is an exceptional situation. We get cohesion in the economic sphere, we get cohesion in the social sphere, and in the political sphere. But then we should go back to reducing the role of the state, and we should go mm -hmm. back to a to to the more or less status quo, the better and improve status quo. Is there any Dimension on which you, you see this moment. I mean, let's think of, of, your, of your your economic historian and put your economic historian hat and think of Venice, did, as you mentioned before, the judiciary, money was born out of the quarantine. The uh, supposedly after the Black Space, uh, the Renaissance was born out of the accumulation of, of capital that, that happened with the Black the Black Space. Mm -hmm. uh, well, some people think that. Let me not discuss that. But do, I can tell you why, but that's not. Okay, let, let, let me, let me uh, give me a pass on that one. So, so now, do we expect, uh, do you expect any long-term ch changes? What would be the long-term changes that you would expect for capitalism after coronavirus? How will it look different in your view? Well, crucially, I don't want to call it capitalism anymore. I'm, I'm in, in innovatism, innovatism sure. is the word. You know this, I am finished with the word capitalism because it really does mislead everyone who uses it. People on the left, people on the right, people in the middle. As soon as they start talking capitalism, they think that sheer accumulation is how we get rich. And accumulation of useless, stupid projects is not how we get rich. Piling bricks on bricks, piling bachelor's degrees on bachelor's degrees doesn't make us rich. What makes us rich is innovation. So it seems to me that the question is, will this episode be used? And I'm not saying these people are bad or anything. They're, some of them are nice. Most of them are nice, I'm sure. But be used by our friends on the left, especially, to argue for the socialization of innovation, where um, Alberto Mingardi and I are, are writing up very long essay, pamphlet, short book on Ma Mariana Mazzucato, an American economist, her, her father was Italian, who writes this way. She says, oh, she, she, she has a 2013 book called The Entrepreneurial State, where she argues that innovation comes from the government. And this, to use the Italian, is pazzo. Use the Spanish loco. To use the English, insane. 
it's not true, and uh, Alberto and I are trying to show it's not. But if they, if they're able to seize the narrative and say, "Aha, you see, we solved this problem by um, centralized authority," that may be a bad thing for innovation. I mean, for example, in, in biological innovation, I think there's a good case again for the government to spend a lot on virology. I think we'd better. This is going to happen again and again and again. Uh, there are a million and a half naturally occurring viruses, separate. They're not the same item. Whew. So we really got to get to work on virology. And that, I think, again, is an appropriate role for a, a small but competent uh, uh, government. And then, I don't know, uh, but, but I don't think it'll affect innovation, transportation, whatever. So no, I, I don't think there will be long-term effects on innovation. And on, on, on any of our key institutions, uh, do you think that uh, your, your expectation is that we go back more or less to the, um, I don't know, the economic world of the 90s and uh, 2000s, the consensus on on, on globalization, free markets, etc. Well, that... I'd like to hear the, the, the mechanism that people have in mind when they say, oh no, the, there are all these newspaper articles, people like to write them, oh, the world will be completely different after this. And the, and the only trouble is they say that all the time. I mean, uh, if the if the copyright of Mickey Mouse expires, they think the world will be completely different. Um, the, I wrote a little piece for a, a Russian website asking whether, asking me whether, uh, what's it called, um, these, these voluntary currencies. Um, cryptocurrencies. Yeah, cri cryptocurrencies will change the world. And I said, well, no, from a historical point of view, money keeps changing and not a heck of a lot turns on it. And I said, oh, no, that can't be. Surely this is going to completely change economics. And I said, no, 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 it's not. <laughs> yes, I've seen people when I'm here. This is the end of the world as we know it. Their little invention, whatever it is, is going to change the world, and, and you know, most of the time, usually it doesn't. And usually doesn't. And this is one one case. Are you are you pretty um, optimistic that our world is, is going to be able to deal with this in a, a relatively short term? Do you think that we are going to be uh, coming back within a relatively short time to a normal uh, normal economy, or is the new normal? That people are talking about something that, that you expect to be uh, to be there for, for a few well, months. Well, I'm hardly an expert on this, but of course you asked, so I'll be glad to tell you yeah. my, my stupid and uninformed opinion, which is that yeah, for you know, that as some as people are pointing out, you really want to avoid having a second wave in the middle of the influenza season next year, because then you'll have two large groups especially the old people who will, with uh, compromised immune systems and so forth, flooding into the hospitals of Spain or the United States, it'll be a real disaster. So no, I, I think, you know, that I, I keep, I'm kind of annoyed that the medical people keep saying, well, it'll be a year, a year and a half. I, well, I wish they wouldn't say that, say, by the way, he's vanished. Uh, there you are. Um, I, I wish they would be like, uh, I, 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 I wish Donald Trump was correct, that there's some magic, uh, magic bullet, magic potion, the, uh, the potion of love to, 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 to quote the great opera of the early 19th century, but there's not, I don't think. So a year, year and a half, and we, we, if we're careful, obviously, the, the Spanish authorities and the American 
and German and everyone else has been saying that the, the reasonable authorities, if we're careful, and I, I'm in favor of using the, the Indian greeting. Um, instead of shaking hands or hugging, say, 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 say a namaste. Namaste. It does seem like a, a change that might be here to stay. Some social distance. Yeah, no handshaking, so. shaking, no kissing, just uh, yeah. nodding. Yeah. You know, one, one could draw a map of Europe of how many kisses do you give. And it's very dangerous not to know which part you're in, because you'll break your nose moving and from side to side. <laughs> I'm afraid that map would look quite correlated with the spread of the disease, to be honest, right now. Italy, Spain, France, yeah. Uh, yeah. there's a lot of kissing in those places. I know, I know. So maybe, maybe in Eastern Europe, especially in Russia, men kiss on the lips. Yeah. It's quite quite wild. So that could be that could be the long term the long term effect. Thank thanks so much, Sylvia. Thanks thanks much for okay, the time. Sure. It's a pleasure to chat to you. Um, we'll uh, we'll be we'll be watching, and I think it's it's kind of refreshing to hear somebody say like, well, look, you know, these things happen, and they don't have to change the world. And I it'll, think that it'll be okay here. You uh, have. You have the Aunt Deirdre blessing. Excellent. Well, thanks very much. Thanks for, for participating and, and uh, um, stay safe, take care of yourself, and uh, hopefully we'll see each other in person sometime soon. Thank you very much. You too. <laughs> Thank you. Bye bye. Hasta luego. I'm trying to learn Spanish. Okay. Hasta luego. Hasta pronto.